You know, it's weird how when you leave someone on the other team wide open next to your net, they tend to score. What's cracking, everybody? And welcome back to Kraken RNR, where the Kraken lose 4-1 to one to the Maple Leafs in Toronto. In a game that I feel like there's going to be some fans coming out of this one, just feeling like it's right back to where we came from, from the last game of the homestand against Carolina. And understandably so. I mean, after all, they did just lose for the second time in three games, 4-1. to one. And while this game, maybe the flow of play seemed a little bit more like they were in it, the score didn't, since they were down 3 nothing until late in the game. But I gotta say, at least for myself anyway, while I do understand that sentiment, if it is one that you have, and ultimately the outcome of the game is the same in both of them, so I suppose it doesn't necessarily matter in the long run, personally I don't feel like the Kraken played nearly as poorly in this game as they did in that one at the end of the homestand against the Canes. In that one, they kind of just got run over the entire game and... Basically, the only saving grace was that they were able to play well in their end of the ice, which, to be fair, is the one place they didn't play well in this game. Still, as far as the flow of the game was concerned, it was pretty even back and forth throughout the entire thing. Both teams had extended shifts in each other's end of the ice. Both teams were able to create pressure offensively and generate some good chances, as well as transition effectively, and I mean that in both directions. Both teams played pretty well in transition, both offensively and defensively. Not a ton or really any significant odd man rushes that I can think of throughout the entire game. And both teams were able, with that good transition game, to switch the momentum when it was going against them. For a little bit, they could get it going right back the other way. Unfortunately, the big difference in this game is what got the Kraken, and that is defensively, one team was pretty sound and didn't allow very many passes across the middle of the ice to get to wide open players on the other side, while the other team did on a number of occasions. And of course, the team that allowed those passes ended up losing. That being the Kraken, obviously. Which for the Kraken is, well, fortunately not something that we've seen a whole lot of so far this season. I mean, sure, over the course of a number of games, occasionally a guy's going to get lost in the defense here and there, but not consistently over and over and over in the course of a single game like what we kind of saw in this one, with really the only other game where I can remember this many defensive breakdowns being the game at the start of the season against the Blues, which we've made the, granted it's an excuse, but I think a fair one, that that was the first regular season game of a new coaching system and some new defensive pairings, new guys to get used to, and all that, so while I would have liked to have a little bit more ironed out by the time you play the first re regular season game, at least that seemed like, for the most part, a one-off as they were able to clean things up pretty quickly and have been playing pretty well in their end of the ice up until this game. Now, I suppose to be perfectly fair, it wasn't terrible the entire game long. It wasn't honestly even as bad as that game against St. Louis, and certainly not as bad as at points in the inaugural season or even last year where... There were stretches of games where it just looked like five chickens with their head cut off in the defensive end and they couldn't keep track of a single player to save their life regardless of their offensive abilities. But at the same time, when you play against a team as talented as the Leafs are, when you do make those mistakes, they're likely to make you pay for it if they have the right guys on the ice and well, at least on three occasions they did. And not only that, but and this is not an excuse for their performance. They're still professional hockey players and they should be able to play more consistent defense than they did in this game. But at least a potential reason for why this game in particular was different for the Kraken defensively is that they were not only still missing Vince Dunn, who will still be out for another few games on LTIR, but also missing Brandon Montour, fresh off of his hat trick in Montreal. Fortunately, that's not injury related. It's a good reason to miss a game is he had to go back home to be with his family for the birth of their second child. So, I mean, look, is it ideal for the Kraken that he had to leave? Certainly not. But yeah, that's, for me, a fair reason to miss one of 82 regular season games. But regardless, it still did leave the Kraken down two of their three best defensemen and their two by far best offensive defensemen, which could have had an impact on the fortunes of the team on the other end of the ice. Though even there, they got some decent pressure, put a few off of posts and just honestly couldn't find the bounces that they were able to find consistently in Montreal. So I don't even know that the one goal that they got was entirely fair to the performance of the team as a whole, offensively. Defensively, though, it did mean that the pairings were once again mixed and matched a little bit, so not the typical pairings that some of these guys are used to, and maybe that leads to some of the miscommunications and guys getting lost behind the defense. Anyway, with all that being said, I think we're going to take a little bit of a different approach to the recap portion of this game. I'm not going to go necessarily moment by moment like I usually do, especially because, like I said, I feel like this game was 
fairly back and forth the entire way. There was no giant swings in momentum. It was just kind of a couple good shifts for one team, followed by a couple good shifts for the either, and it was fairly back and forth. There was, I think, three power plays apiece for either team, and no one scored on the power play, so it's not like we have any big special team. So it's not like we have any big special teams issues to go over. We're instead just going to focus on the mistakes that the Kraken made that led to those goals. And of course, we'll talk about the one Kraken goal as well towards the end of the game. So we'll still get the highlights. And at the very least, it should become pretty clear why I spent the time I did talking about the Kraken defensive issues, which honestly start from pretty early on in the game. The Kraken get off to a good start, so they don't really have to play that much defense for the first few minutes. But then the two teams trade power plays that overlap a bit. So during that four on four time, this is where we get the first glimpse of some defensive blunders from the Kraken, where off of a face-off, I want to say, in their end of the ice during the four-on-four, four, one of the Maple Leafs just gets completely lost behind the plate. Domi finds him on the back door, but fortunately, Decord is able to read this play, I mean, absolutely perfectly. He makes this save look way, way easier than it has any business being. As he pushes off to go from one side of the net to the other to cover the back door shot, almost in the same moment that Domi decides to make the pass. And it's a good thing he does too, because again, there's only one player on that side of the ice and it's a Maple Leaf pretty close to the net. Fortunately, Joey reads it so well that he's able to be square to the puck when it's shot and is able to freeze it instantly without even giving up a rebound, which again is good because there was, again, just one player on that side of the ice to pick up the rebound and it was the same guy that shot the puck. So thanks to Decord, the Kraken dodged the first bullet there and then Decord has some heroics on the... Maple Leaf power play that comes immediately after that, which by the way, yes, Decord in net for the fourth game in a row. And it that could either mean that the Kraken have decided on a starter at this point, or and this was pointed out in the comments of the last one. It is quite possible that Grubauer is dealing with some kind of undisclosed injury. That's definitely possible early on in the season. Once you get into the game action, pull something. And while maybe it's not worth putting him on the injured list and he could still go in if needed to, it's better to just let him rest up and get 100%, especially with Decord playing as well as he is. Anyway, like I said, Decord gets the Kraken through all of that and some more Maple Leaf momentum that comes out of the power play. We go back to back and forth right up until the final seconds of the period. The Kraken iced the puck twice, which, yes, does mean a couple face-offs in the Kraken end of the ice, but with just 16 seconds left in the period, it really shouldn't be that big of a deal. I mean, yes, as Kraken fans, we're conditioned after the last three years to just expect things to go poorly after a face-off in the Kraken end, but they've been a lot better at winning face-offs to this point in the season, and honestly, with 16 seconds left in the period, it should not be that hard to kill off the rest of the clock and just get the first intermission still scoreless. The first one, I can't remember if the Kraken win it, I think they probably do because they get possession of it pretty quickly and then send it back down the ice. It does turn into another icing, and it was not necessarily a high percentage play that anything else was going to come of it other than icing. But now you've got a second face-off with just eight seconds left in the period. And at that point, there's really no excuse not to be able to kill off eight seconds from a face-off to get to the intermission. But of course, in those eight seconds, with Stevenson taking the face-off for the Kraken, their best center at taking face-offs, so you'd think it really shouldn't be a problem then with him out there. On the other side is Austin Matthews. And Austin Matthews just goes right through Stevenson like he's not even there off the faceoff, down to the goal line, and then throws a pass across. The first one actually blocked by Borgen, but the puck goes right back to Matthews. The second one gets through Borgen to a wide open Mitch Marner on the back door. Once again, Decord reads it perfectly to get to that side of the net and prevent Marner from being able to score. But equally, unfortunately for the Kraken, Marner... I don't know if he reads that Decord is seeing the play that well, or it's just Marner and he doesn't shoot the puck. So he instead passes it back across Decord's face to an equally wide open Nyes. And Nyes, with Decord having no chance to make a second instant move, puts it into a basically half empty net to give the Leafs the one nothing lead with just four seconds left on the clock. I mean, first of all, obviously... Not ideal to have your best face-off center get absolutely run through by the best player and really not even put up that much of a defense for Matthews to just go past him with the puck. I mean, it's one thing if Matthews wins it back cleanly and he gets up to the blue line, there's not much you can do about that, but he could at the very least try to make a little bit more of a speed bump at the very least or wall to prevent Matthews from getting the puck down closer to the net. Instead, yeah, Stevenson just kind of lets him right through. So already off to a bad start, but at least there with Matthews having the puck down by the goal line in the corner, 
It's a very tight angle, Decord's got it sealed off, so it's still not particularly dangerous as long as the rest of your team has responded in kind and gone to their respective spots to cover any potential passing lanes. Which, to be fair, Borgen did. He managed to even block the first attempted pass from Matthews. But the rest of the team, I guess, just figured that those eight seconds were going to disappear as soon as the puck was dropped because somehow not one, but two Leaf players were able to get wide open in front of Decord so that when that pass does get across, even with Decord able to read it perfectly the first time, it didn't even matter that Decord made the first read perfectly because he doesn't have a chance to make the second one. So in the end, aside from Borgen blocking the first attempted pass, the Leafs do basically whatever the heck they want in those eight seconds with the puck, like there's not even other Kraken players on the ice. And as a result, you go to the first intermission down one more goal than you should be. So then it could probably go without saying that that's far from an ideal way to end a period, but it's still just a one goal game. And at the other end, you've been creating some pretty good chances of your own, or at least creating some sustained pressure at the other end of the ice on multiple occasions already. And especially against a goaltender who's only played one game so far this season and it didn't go particularly well, you like your chances to at least be able to even things up in the next period. Unfortunately, in the first couple of minutes of the second period, the Kraken have a breakdown as the Leafs get into the offensive end, and Toronto doesn't even have to bother getting set up in the offensive end. As they enter, they just come clean in off the transition, which, like I said, pretty good transitions both ways. The Kraken just not quite able to solidify the blue line on this particular occasion, but that's fine as long as you get down deep into your end of the ice and make sure there aren't any wide open Maple Leafs, especially on, let's say, the backside of the play where Decord isn't going to be able to get to, or, you know, you can't keep expecting Decord to get there instantly like he has already twice. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happens as Riley dives deep into the Kraken end of the ice with the puck and then finds a wide open Nylander on the far side. One of the best goal scorers the Leafs have has managed to get lost behind the entire Kraken defense. He's on the back door. As long as the puck gets to him clean, it's in the back of the net. And well, the pass does force him to handle at least once before firing off the shot. Like I said, it's such a wide open play for him at the point where he gets the puck that he has the time to make that one move and then put it into the net right as Decord tries to dive across. Unfortunately, just not much of anything Decord could do about this other than hope for a miracle by throwing his glove in front of it. It doesn't happen. The puck goes in the net and the Kraken are now down two to nothing. And I mean, look, to be fair, the Kraken do a couple of things well in this defensive setup on the rush into the offensive end. For one, they've got Borgen, who's at least making the passing lane harder for Riley to find. And they do have someone on the leaf right in front of the net. So it's not like they've got a guy wide open right in front of Decord. The problem is, yeah, basically just Nylander on the back door that nobody followed there. Meanwhile, you have inexplicably both wingers in the middle of the slot standing next to each other, neither one of which has gone to cover Nylander. And I mean, sure, having at least one guy in the middle of the ice is a good thing to have defensively, but at least one of those two has to be able to follow Nylander down to the side of the net or really wherever he goes. I don't care if he goes behind the net to try and get a pass down there. You have to have somebody that's down there to help respond to the number of opponent players that there are by the net. You can't afford to have more opponents by your net than you have your own players. And this is exactly why. But you know what? It's all right. Mistakes happen. Just learn from it. Go back to the bench. Look at the iPad or Microsoft Surface or whatever kind of tablet they have the replays on on the bench. Look at it as a group, as a line, defensive pairing, whatnot. Figure out what you did wrong and just make sure it doesn't happen again, right? Well... <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, but just a few minutes later in the middle of the period, pretty much the same exact problem arises. And wouldn't you know it, it comes right off another offensive zone entry through the transition from the Leafs, as they get actually right across the same part of the blue line, the far side from the bench is the left side of the defensive end for the Kraken. I don't know that the side that they come in necessarily matters, but I think there's something telling in the fact that both of these goals end up coming right after the Leafs enter the offensive end before the Kraken really have a chance to get their defense set up and start pushing things to the outside. And for the second time in a row, this time it's Nylander with the puck. He throws it to the middle of the ice from a similar spot from where Riley made the pass on the previous goal. This time the Kraken do have the center of the ice pretty well. Actually, the first time they had the center of the ice pretty well locked down. And once again, that's the case as I... I think it was Pacioretty that this pass is intended to. The Kraken are able to defend that pretty well. The puck kind of bounces around in the slot a little bit. Decord isn't able to get to it. The Kraken can't get to it cleanly either. 
Eventually, it's Tavares who ends up picking up the puck. And then while he's facing back down the other way from a knee, he just kind of curls it and flicks it back down to the back door, the far side of the net, where Nylander, who is apparently turned invisible the second that he passed the puck, is just kind of curled around behind the net, and he's standing right there in the same spot, wide open for the second time. Puck gets to him. This time, he doesn't need to handle it twice, and he puts it into, well couple feet of space that Decord had to leave as he was switching from one side of the net to the other. So, I mean, I don't know what it is about that player, that part of the ice that the Kraken just figured wasn't a problem, but clearly it was a problem twice and both times it ended up behind Decord without anything he could really do about it. And look, it's bad enough to allow one of the opposing teams and really one of the NHL's best goal scorers to just stand next to the net without any competition whatsoever. And while I, like I said on the previous one, it's good to have some presence in the middle of the ice, especially in front of the net. What I don't think you necessarily need to do is to have four of, honestly, maybe even five, all five of your skaters in the slot to try to defend whatever is happening. Because not only is Nylander wide open with three Kraken players standing in front of Decord, and no Leafs are still there, by the way. I mean, even Pacioretty has worked his way up to the blue line, or maybe that's actually him on the far side, also wide open by the bottom of the face-off circle, by the way. So even if the pass had gone to him, he's going to get a wide open shot from a dangerous location. Instead, it goes to the other wide open guy from an even more dangerous location while you have, again, three players in the slot for no reason whatsoever. I mean, at least Eberly and I think the other one's McCann that are on either side of Tavares, who still manages to get the pass off from a knee, by the way. I mean, at least they have a reason to be there. They were a couple of the players that were whacking away at the puck to try to get possession of it. Ultimately, just Tavares is able to find it first. There's just absolutely no excuse to have three guys standing basically right next to each other, not participating in this play whatsoever. Now I know what you might be thinking. One screenshot doesn't tell the whole story of what's going on. It doesn't show everything that was going on in this play. And yeah, having three guys in one single spot of the defensive end is not a good idea, regardless of where that one spot is, even if it is the most dangerous part of the defensive end. But at least in this one shot, you can see that Beneers is looking towards the other side. I mean, well, he's facing towards the other side. He's looking where the puck is. He's probably getting ready to try and block off a pass to the other side so that Decor doesn't have to go back and forth again. And maybe there shouldn't be a guy wide open over there. But, I mean, at least he's trying to block off a pass, right? Or maybe the other two guys are trying to create a wall so there's no possible way a pass can get to the other side of Decord. Well, as it turns out, there's absolutely nobody over there whatsoever. The other two guys that aren't in this screenshot are up by the blue line. Here's another look at it. All five Leafs are on one side of the defensive end. And the Kraken have all five of their players standing next to each other in the slot, blocking off a passing lane that is only to an empty half of ice. So even in some weird world where for whatever reason you have decided you want three players in one spot of your own end of the ice, these three have chosen a completely pointless place to all be. I mean, not only are they in the slot with nobody to block off a passing lane to on the other side, they're even on the far side of the slot away from where the entirety of the opposing team is set up. And look, I don't necessarily want to pick on Beneers in particular among the three of them since he has been very good as a defensive forward so far this season and was last year. That's a very strong part of his game. He's had some great moments, but in this one, he honestly looks the worst of the three. The other two are two defensemen that are not used to playing with each other. So maybe there's some just communication issues there. Veneers, though, is a center that should know he doesn't necessarily need to be right in front of the goaltender when both defensemen are there. And on top of all that, he's the one of the three of them that is facing the wrong direction. Again, the direction where nobody is aside from the fans on the other side of the glass. Anyway, that does bring us to the end of the at least meaningful goals that the Leafs score in this game. Well, I suppose the empty netter has some meaning. It does effectively snuff out the Slim chance the Kraken had of coming back in this game when we get to the final few minutes of the third. But at least this is the end of the big, consequential defensive mistakes and blunders that the Kraken make. So at least I guess they learned their lesson here midway through the second. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen until they're already down 3 nothing. And honestly, if it wasn't for Decord a couple of times, could have been down much more than that. From here, not much else happens. I mean, we continue to go back and forth. Generally, aside from it, not feeling nearly as competitive as far as who was going to win the game at this point. 
it was still a well-played game with chances at either end of the ice, so still just fun hockey to watch if you discount what the score is and any ties you have to who's going to win the game. So eventually we get to the last few minutes where I will say the one thing from a coaching perspective that I really liked about how the Kraken play this game is that they end up pulling Decord with almost five and a half minutes left in the game, north of five minutes. I want to say it was like five, 20 plus seconds. So yeah, right about five and a half minutes left of the game is where they pulled a cord to go empty net, which is quite aggressive for the regular season. But like you're down three goals, you need to make something happen. Not only are you down three goals, but you're down three nothing. So it's not like you've even produced offense that you have to go off of in a plan. You're still trying to find the back of the net for the first time. And on top of that, they also picked a good time to pull to cord. It wasn't like after they dump the puck into the offensive end and they just hope that they'll get there on the four check while Decord gets to the bench and then inevitably the other team gets to it first before a sixth guy can even get on the ice. They actually waited until they were set up five on five in the offensive end to bring the sixth guy on. So at the very least, you don't have to worry about the empty net getting hit right away with still over five minutes left in the game. And then you look really silly for pulling the goaltender at that point. And I mean, obviously it's still a long shot even with five and a half minutes of an extra man on the ice to score three to come back late in the third, especially without a major penalty to help you out, for example. But the Kraken are able to stay in the offensive end for a lot of it, and eventually they do get one of them back with about three and a half minutes in, so a couple minutes after they pulled a cord. It's Tolvanen who gets some empty ice, thanks to having the extra guy on the ice. He fires off a shot, it goes through a whole bunch of traffic, and finds the back of the net to give Tolvanen his fourth of the season, second in as many games on the road trip, and also, at the very least, break up the shutout. And I won't lie, call me an optimist, but it at least gave me a glimmer of hope that with this one going in and still over three minutes left in the game, there was an ever so slight chance that the Kraken would be able to at least force overtime. Of course, as we know, that doesn't end up happening. They do get a couple more chances. I think they got at least another one off the post. I want to say they hit the post three or four times in this game. Eventually, after actually some time that the Leafs spent in the offensive end trying very desperately, it seemed, to get Nylander the hat trick. The Kraken defend the empty net pretty well, get it back to the other end of the ice, where eventually Austin Matthews shows off his pool skills, bounces it off the sideboards and all the way down to the other end of the net, all the way down to the other end into the net to get the empty net goal. And again, snuff out the slim amount of hope that there was that the Kraken could come back in this one. At that point, there was just over a minute left and yeah you're not coming back down from three nothing with whatever amount two two minutes to a minute and a half something like that so then one last time with this game the kraken lose it four to one and while there might have still been some more things they could have done offensively i mean it's hard to score just one goal late in a game with the man advantage with the net empty and not say that you could have done more offensively they at least created consistent pressure throughout the game Got some good chances, they just put a lot of them off of the plumbing around Wool in net rather than past him into it. But, I mean, Wool played pretty well, you gotta give him credit. The Leafs played very well defensively, keeping most of the Kraken chances to the outside. And even the ones that they did get up around the net were fairly well contested, so they didn't get any clean, very good looks. At least at 5-on-5 five five anyway, they did get some pretty good looks on the different power plays, and then at the end of the game obviously with the Tolvan in goal, but some other chances with the extra guy out on the ice for the empty net. So yeah, could have been maybe a little bit more offensively, could have maybe got more traffic in front of the net. There were a couple of chances where it looks like the Kraken were going for tip-ins rather than screening Wool and taking away his eyes. So there's some things there that maybe you clean up in the offensive end, and obviously missing your two best offensive defensemen doesn't help. The defensive end is still, to me, really where the Kraken lost this game. Three big mistakes that end up costing them and a couple other ones that didn't because Decord was fantastic in net in spite of what his numbers are going to end up looking like because of the defense around him, at least in the few key moments anyway. So then with that, I think we can close things out on this game. There's not much more to say. We can finish out with the Kraken three stars, though I'm not sure we're going to get to three stars and move on to the weekend back-to-back -back where the Kraken should have Montour back in coming off of a hat trick and now the birth of a kid with some extra dad energy. Who knows, maybe he can somehow be even better than he has been for the Kraken in the early part of the season, and we can get back to the winning ways in Ottawa. As for the three stars, though, yeah, there's, I don't think there's going to be three. I am going to give Joey Decord one. I know his numbers aren't necessarily going to look fantastic, but I thought he was great in net for the Kraken. Again, makes a couple of saves that I honestly would not necessarily have blamed him if they had gone in. And then beyond that... 
I feel like Jaden Schwartz played a, a pretty decent game. He was involved in a lot of the offense the Kraken did create, even if it didn't end up in the back of the net. And he's always one of those guys that just kind of flies under the radar. Plus, he wasn't that I can remember directly involved in any of the big defensive blunders that the Kraken had in there under the ice that cost them. So, yeah, we'll we'll go Decord and Schwartz just because I, I don't necessarily think that the Kraken played such a horrendous game that we can't find anybody. But as always, I'd love to know your thoughts down in the comment section below. What you thought of this game, if you would have had any stars, if you would have had a third, or who your two would have been down in the comments. And until next time, for the weekend back-to-back, -back, stay safe out there, be good to each other, God bless, and go Kraken.